Welcome to episode 40 of The Brainstorm. Compliance tells me we're only allowed to say that we expect one of these things to go to the moon, and that's Starship, so we'll be talking about that later. But we're excited to talk about Ethereum first with our newest associate on the crypto team, Lorenzo Valente. Lorenzo, maybe maybe a quick intro uh, on your background, and then we can dive into the Denkun update and, and what it means yeah, sure. Hey, everyone, and uh, happy to be uh, here in my, my first episode. Uh, so uh, I come from a mechanical engineering background. Um, I started my own uh, OTC desk, own startup. Uh, I did that for a year and a half, more or less. And then I joined a crypto investment fund uh, focused on uh, long tail of assets uh, and trading. Uh, I work for two other blockchain startups, uh, one uh, on Ethereum and the other one on Solana. And yeah, very happy to be uh, one of the new research associates and uh, working the digital asset team now. Well, so you've got the Ethereum and Solana experience. I'm sure we'll dive into that because I feel like, you know, those those two two fanatics uh, user bases on Twitter going at it. But maybe we just start off with the Denkun update and what it was, why it's so important. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe just high level takeaways. Yeah. Sure. So uh, it was last Wednesday, uh, the Denkun update went live, or EIP 4844 also, or Pro- Proto Denk Sharding, which has a few uh, weird names. Uh, so this was a very important technical upgrade for the Ethereum network, uh, more than a mon- monetary one, uh, and especially regarding layer two uh, scaling solutions. So layer twos, just to set the stage, they're the main scaling solutions for Ethereum. Um, they are small blockchains that live on top of Ethereum. They inherit most of Ethereum security, uh, but they're cheaper to use. And so, these projects started four or five years ago, and they're part of the broader uh, Ethereum strategy to scale the, the blockchain. And so the Denkun upgrade um, was particularly important for these layer twos because they were going to, I mean, they did uh, decrease the, um, the transaction cost uh, for users' transaction on, th- on, these, on these layer twos. Um, so yeah, I don't know how uh, if you want me to, to uh, delve a bit into the the, the technical, uh, but yeah, the most important thing is a throughput increase and uh, and the cost decrease for users uh, on these layer twos. So hopefully, um, this is the state. This is the first stage of a very broad and long uh, Ethereum scaling roadmap. So there will be other two stages, um, hopefully in the next two or three years. And the final sta- stage uh, is called uh, Deng sharding, uh, which will happen in two, three, four years, maybe. So yeah, that's that's the uh, the, the overview. L- Lorenzo, one welcome, welcome to the show, welcome to Arc. It's it's a pleasure to have you. Um, when you think, uh, maybe just help the the listeners and viewers understand why the layer two ecosystem is so important to Ethereum scaling. Um, and then also, if you can compare that to a blockchain like Solana, which is you know already has high throughput and lower fees associated with it, if you could you know compare and contrast the two, and then just also set up how you know why the layer two is so important to Ethereum. Sure. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a really good question. So one of the I guess in, in these distributed systems, um, it, it really depends what trade-offs you want to make, right? When you when you construct a, a blockchain, and so one of the the trade-offs that Ethereum is not willing to make at all is um, increasing the hardware requirements for nodes on the on the blockchain, right? So nodes um, they have to store and compute every transaction on the blockchain. There are these copies of the blockchain around the world. Um, and so this upgrade and the whole scaling roadmap of Ethereum is based on the um, on the fact that uh, they want to keep the node re- the hardware requirements for node low, right? So this is 
a very important fact. Um, other uh, VMs, so virtual machines and blockchains, uh, such as Solana, you mentioned, but also Sui and Aptos, they're willing to make um, a different set of trade-offs. And so if you think kind of the two scaling approaches, Ethereum is more by microservices. So unbundling the core functions of the blockchain, optimizing them, and just relying on other projects to uh, to improve them, right? And then on the other hand, on the other hand, you have um, the we call them the high performance chain, so Solana, Sui, and Aptos, and they're willing to make another set of trade offs and scale more via Moore's law, and so they rely on chips getting uh, you know less expensive and more performant, and so the nodes will be able to use these chips and they will be able to uh, scale the base layer by having more throughput and and less latency. So. These are kind of two scaling um, approaches right now in the in the blockchain world. Hmm. That's interesting. Do you think one is better than the other, or you think like end end state? All of these are kind of just competing, and users accept whatever trade offs. Or do you think that this is more of a divergent path, and one set of trade offs wins out? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, um, I mean, there are differently two two different communities, right? And two uh, two philosophies behind it. I think you're already seeing um, both scaling solutions, um, you know, joining. I mean, making trade offs. For example, th there are a couple of of projects uh, that are raising right now that are using some parts of the SVM, so the, the Solana virtual machine, but also using uh, parts of the Ethereum virtual machine. So they're, um, yeah, doing a bit of mix and match of things that are, you know, uh, uh, good on one chain, and but, but can, you know, the, they could also take uh, take advantage of some, of some optimizations on the other chain. So, I mean, we don't have the, the, um, the answer right now. I do think... Overall, um, Ethereum will try to scale the base layer also. And I think within this scaling uh, roadmap, there, there are efforts to do that. And I think at some point also Solana um, will have to uh, scale, you know, with other other techniques and 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 more, something more like Ethereum with, with either rollups or a, a other um, scaling solutions. Uh, so we'll see. But for now... It's definitely the two two philosophies, two communities, and two uh, uh, two approaches to scaling. But the the important thing for the end user, like like Nick, is you won't be paying four hundred dollars on gas fees when you're when you're buying crypto NFTs. <laughs> you won't uh, unless you're transacting on on Ethereum layer one. But yeah, if you if you're on layer twos, which which you should be at this point. Uh, yeah, it, it will be cheaper. So th this is good news. <laughs> Terrific. And then maybe just the last, you know, we've. I feel like that's a good high level takeaway. Maybe the, just the last minute or so, take us take us into the weeds for the people who want to hear it. What's what was the technical side of this upgrade? Yeah. Uh, so. EIP four eight four four or or Denkun um, introduces a new type of data storage. I mean, they introduce blobs. So basically, you can think of blobs are as large data pa packets that uh, set the stage for a different uh, a different storage technique. Uh, so up to now, um, rollups had to uh, post call data. To, to the Ethereum layer one, which was very expensive because it needed to be stored and computed by, by every node on the network. And so blobs uh, will be a more efficient type of storage and transient. So after, I think right now it's 18, 18 days, but it's still up for discussion. So between 18 and 30 days, it will be pruned um, uh, of, of the blockchain. So that it will be erased and, and essentially that will make you know, storage more efficient and, and cheaper. So that's kind of the te technical take. Hmm. Isn't the, I guess, one of the 
the reasons that blockchain is so attractive is that everything is stored and you can go back and verify. So how, how can you help me understand when you say delete or, you know, it's erased, how does that fit into the, the blockchain narrative that at least I have in my mind, which is you can always go back and verify a transaction took place, even if it's, you know, a decade ago. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess you're right. Uh, for for rollups in particular, so there are two solutions. Um, Twenty to thirty days is enough time for an honest actor to basically retrieve the information and make sure it was correct, correctly computed and stored. Um, and so, for the for the layer two solutions, this is an acceptable trade off. Um, and it gives enough guarantees uh, for yeah users and and in general uh, other applications. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Nick, like the the final the final stage of of this scaling roadmap, which is dank sharding, will be uh, to break the blockchain into smaller pieces. And so every node won't have to compute and store everything on the blockchain. They will they will just have to do it for a small a small parts, and then they will give enough guarantees to the other nodes, so you you'll be able to reconcile the blockchain and and ba every basically, you know, guaranteeing that they, that uh, they're acting um, uh, kind of truthfully. So, but you're you're right. I mean, you're right. The question, uh, the, you know, the question uh, is fair, and uh, yeah, I think I think it's just the the, the trade offs that the that the the blockchain has has to do to to scale. Yeah. Oh, that's fair. Amazing. I've, I've understood this much better the, the second time around listening to it and, and with these questions. So Lorenzo, thank you so much. Uh, this is super, super great and insightful. Yeah. Thank you, Lorenzo. Yeah. Thanks to you. Uh, th no, thanks to you guys. It was a pleasure. All right. I guess that brings us to the second topic, which is SpaceX's Starship, which could take us to the moon and beyond. Sam, I did not watch. I, I'm guilty Nick, of not watching. History. I missed it's history. history. How, are you, how are you not I'm watching? going to go back, but I want you to describe it for me. Did it, what, what ended up happening to the ship? Did it blow up? Where is it? I know the last one they lost for a bit. Um, it's, it was glorious, Nick, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do my, my, my demo. You got Starship, which is the piece on top. You've got like the heavy booster, which is the piece underneath. It's essentially a 40 story skyscraper launching up into the atmosphere. Uh, so they successfully separated. So that's stage separation. The booster successfully turned its engines on, flew back. When it came to try and splash down, it, not all of the engines relit. And so it seems like it uh, exploded. Took a beating. Roughly, I think they said like 150 to 100 meters above the the water or something like that. It, it it separated. This piece, orbital velocity, super exciting, keeps going. Uh, in space, it demonstrated the various things that it was trying to demonstrate, which was kind of like a, a fueling capability, opening up uh, the its its quote mouth, so that it could, in theory, dispense satellites it was supposed to relight its engine in orbit which it did not and then eventually well actually the other cool part as it's coming back through the atmosphere it had starlink antennas on it and so you could see like the plasma building up on it as it's coming through the atmosphere and it also uh, eventually disintegrated slash blew up upon re-entry uh all in all I would say super, super successful test flight. Obviously we want to get to the splashdowns, controlled splashdown stages. Um, I think for us watching it, this is not a, okay, can Starship work? It's now a, when does it work, right? Like it seems extremely compelling uh, the progress they're making. The other thing is it seems like even with what they did this time, they could use it as an expendable rocket to put uh, satellites into orbit. 
And I think that's okay. a huge, huge point, right? So it's like their next test, test flight. I think they're trying to fly it six times this year. They could try and use it to put something into orbit, whether that's some giant Starlink satellites or a cyber truck. You know, they, they threw up the Roadster. Um, it's very compelling. And then just on the math side of it, um, I'll pull up the numbers because Elon tweeted this out and I thought this was pretty impressive just alone. So he said that uh, max payload in expendable mode is around 200 tons. And, you know, some people have estimated that the cost to build a Starship is $100 million. So if you take both of these as being correct, then the cost to space is $500 per kilogram, we'll say, to low Earth orbit. Uh, a reusable Falcon 9, we're estimating, is kind of just below $1,000. So just the magnitude of payload capability is leading to further cost declines here in expendable mode. So you can imagine when they do get this to reusable, this is how you get that order of magnitude drop in cost to space. Why did they decide to do a controlled splashdown versus I think in the past they've tried to land part of the ship. So are they just, you know, saying, okay, for right now, let's focus on a different part of the progress versus trying to reland the booster or was what was the decision there? Yeah, I think this is it's incremental steps which make sense. If you do a gentle splashdown as your end goal and you have a hard splashdown, then you're making a big splash in the water as opposed to if you're trying to land it onto the landing pad and it doesn't work out, you're demolishing extremely expensive uh, hardware on the ground. Ultimately, like that, I think that will be an interesting step. Eventually, they're going to have to test it. And, you know, they've got kind of these like chopstick yeah. catchers on the landing. It wouldn't surprise me if they blow up one of those by accident, um, but it's it's iterative, and eventually they will have to be able to land it on that. And do we know, or do we have any insights on when the next launch will be, and what you know the incremental steps to look for will be in the next launch? Yeah. So given that they want to launch, I think it is you know high single digits this year. I'd imagine in the next few months, they'll try and launch another one. They've got a number of these built already. You know, they always go through, it's kind of incredible the amount of data they collect and are able to use to make improvements. So improvements on the rocket engines, probably on, you know, the the various elements on the heating and things like that. Um, and so they, you know, they work hard. They work long hours over there. I'd imagine as soon as they can get regulatory approval, they're going to try and get back up there. Um, what I said before, I do think I think they'll try and put something into space with the next one and make it like a used usable launch, right? Because they need to do these test flights anyway. So it's kind of if you can use it for commercial purpose, that's like a free launch essentially. Well, they ultimately need to do a test with some sort of payload, yeah. right? So you might as well throw another vehicle into space if you're doing it. It's good marketing. Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> the, the, the Roadster needs company. Right, yeah. Is there a website to track the Roadster? I'm actually curious. Oh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't checked it in a while. I do think the, I mean, maybe it wasn't underappreciated it's just really mind blowing is the video that was coming off of the rocket, the starship is just, it was such high quality. It's going, you know, tens of thousands of miles an hour. It's going through the atmosphere and you're still getting high quality image. It opens your eyes to what the future of connectivity can look like. And, you know, if you get, if you get good service coming through the atmosphere, I'm sure you'll be fine in your remote work from home setup. Yeah, I agree. The video quality. I think Elon posted a picture and said, I can't believe this image is real to your point, Sam, about the quality. And I'm I'm committing to watching the next one because I need to, given I hung a 
photo of Starship over my bed, which took a lot of convincing with the wife. So I, I probably need to be more <laughs> a part of this journey or at least follow along. Um, otherwise, it would seem silly. Yeah, uh, I, I recommend, you know, if you've got kids, you should have them watch it too. This is this is exciting. We're going to the moon and beyond. Um, it, it really is awe inspiring. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. I think that's our our show. Sam, thank you. Lorenzo, thank you. Um, see, see you next week. week.